Hello there, and welcome to this Obstetrics and Gynaecology podcast um, on postpartum hemorrhage. Um, my name's Ed, and I'm with Kenga again today. Hi, Kenga. Hi. Welcome back. Thanks for having me back. That's okay. Um, in this podcast, we're going to be looking at a very important obstetric emergency, which is postpartum hemorrhage. In particular, we're going to be looking at definitions of postpartum hemorrhage, the causes and risk factors, and then going to be considering the management of this topic, both a general approach to management and then various medical and surgical therapies that can be used. So, Kenga, why is this an important topic? Um, it's important because in the 2003 to 2005 UK confidential inquiries into maternal deaths, um, hemorrhage was actually the third highest direct cause of death. What were the other ones? Um, pulmonary embolism, preeclampsia. Okay. Um, so actually it's one of the ones where you can prevent it from happening and if it happens there are treatments available um, to basically control it. So everyone on labour ward should be um, educated about the management of postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah, and it's not just gynaecologists and obstetricians who are involved in the management of this condition, is it? That's also important. Um, Haematologists often involved with major obstetric hemorrhages, the medical team, things like that. So it's a sort of generally important topic. Yeah, there are, there are lots of different causes for it and obviously it's a multidisciplinary team management. I love that word. Okay, so what exactly is postpartum hemorrhage? Okay, so postpartum hemorrhage can be divided into primary and secondary. Um, primary postpartum hemorrhage is more than 500 millilitres of blood loss in the first 24 hours. Now, uh, many people might think, well, actually, a woman does lose quite mm. a large amount of blood anyway um, when she delivers, and that's kind of fairly true in, um, in cesarean sections, but not so much in vaginal deliveries. Um, and basically, they can be divided into mild, moderate, and severe. Um, figures I've put on the slide there, mild is 500 millilitres to 1,000 millilitres, moderate is 1,000 to 2,000, and severe is, you know, we're talking about a lot of blood loss here, 2,000 um, millilitres. Um, and basically secondary postpartum hemorrhage is abnormal bleeding from 24 hours after delivery to 12 weeks post-delivery, um, and the very different causes uh, for both of them. Okay. Just one question that I really have from this slide is, um, obviously when you're watching a delivery, um, you don't measure the blood loss, do you? You can't really measure it in terms of, well, that's 500 mils of blood, that's 1,000 mils of blood. As you quite rightly said before, it can be quite deceiving. Um, so are these, in fact, quite abstract figures that don't actually, uh, well, they have a, a meaning, but surely the, the patient's state is probably more important. I think midwives are actually trained to notice how much blood loss there is going on. Oh, okay. And one of the most important things is to actually see if that blood is clotting. We've got ways of doing that. Um, I've heard of people throwing blood just, you know, on, on to the wall just to see if it actually clots. But that's one of the things they do. And it sounds odd, but they do do it. Um, like pasta. Yes. Um, <laughs> and basically, it's really important in cases of moderate to severe that you've noticed how much blood they've lost in terms of how much you need to give them later okay. on. So it's experience really that allows you to say mild, moderate, severe. You're not actually weighing the blood or anything like that. No, or... no, you're not getting the blood and weighing it because obviously it's, you know, you're hoping, it, well, it's kind of going on the labelled floor, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. um, but you do need to be vigilant. And most, most of the times you actually know the women who are already at risk, which I'll talk about later, okay. and you can then um, kind of note down how much blood loss there is. Okay, let's press on. Okay, so I'm going to go into the causes. Um, now, these are the four T's I learned as a medical student. Um, I'm sure everyone will know the four T's. I don't. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> first of all is tone. So this is the actual tone of the uterus. Mm -hmm. um, now, what's really important is when, when you're post-delivery, um, the mechanisms that happen is that actually you get an increase in the hormone oxytocin, um, which causes uterine contraction. Okay, and this actually um, contracts and causes compression of the intermyometrial blood vessels. Okay, and it stops the bleeding. There is no contraction of the uterus for different reasons. Then these continue to bleed, and you get um, blood loss. And that's called uterine atony. Yes, is that correct. Yeah. What about risk factors for that? Um, a key risk factor is um, multiple gestation um, and 
basically that's when you've got kind of more than one um, fetus mm -hmm. um, and the uterus is stretched so much that it's unable to contract back to normal okay. size. Okay. So what about tissue? Okay, well in tissue the placental retention is a key problem here um, and what happens is that usually the placenta should deliver within 30 minutes of the um, baby delivering um, but if it doesn't for some reason then you actually get an altered structure of the uterus which stops it from contracting properly. Um, now the risk factors to this are conditions such as um, placenta accreta, percreta and increta. Now, that all sounds a bit complicated. It, yeah, it does, yeah. Essentially what they are is, um, it's the amount of kind of invasion of the um, uterine tissue that, that the centre actually does. Now, usually it shouldn't really invade into the myometrium too much, mm -hmm. but um, in terms of um, accreta, percreta and increta, it's actually over invaded and then isn't able to um, come away from the uterus so easily. Now, a creature is kind of the most mildest form of this, um, with increase of being the most severe. Um, and it can actually cause massive, massive problems. Because if you can't, if you can't get the placenta out, then you either need to go to surgery to kind of manually evacuate it, or in the worst, worst cases, you need to do a hysterectomy. Goodness me. Okay, the next T is trauma. Okay, now these often can happen. Um, they're not the most common causes of postpartum hemorrhage, um, but obviously cervical and vaginal lacerations and um, episiotomies often done in instrumental deliveries. Mm. Um, so what can happen is they can cause hidden hematomas and you often see that the woman is shocked in terms of kind of hemorrhage but um, is actually disproportionate to bleeding. So in this case, you won't see the mild, moderate, severe bleeding that I talked about earlier. Absolutely, yeah. So they'll be shocked, but the shock is because they're pouring blood to within an internal cavity, yes. a hematoma. Okay. And then the last one is thrombin. Okay, so this is basically any clotting abnormalities the lady may have um, previous to delivering. Now, this is the one thing that you can actually um, know about before before you know it occurs so um, I mean examples really are examples really are things like um, von Willebrand's disease so platelet disorders if the lady I mean usually they shouldn't be on um, things like warfarin but if they have been on warfarin then um, obviously they're you know that thins their blood and their iron is increased um, so that kind of thing can often cause increased bleeding. That's the kind of thing that you know about and hopefully be able to prevent. Yes, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you obviously want to get your haematologist involved with, maybe medical team, and um, obviously for things like um, warfarin, there are kind of products that you can use. Alternatives. Yes. Okay, so that's actually quite a good uh, topic to move on to now, and that's the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. What do we actually do um, to try and prevent it happening in um, the first place. Okay, so previous to kind of this happening, you, the woman would have come into antenatal clinic and you would have checked her haemoglobin and you would have checked for any clotting disorders. So that involves basically checking the INR, the APTT levels, the platelet levels. And if any of these are deranged, then obviously you try and correct for that before she delivered. Um, if there has been a previous C-section, then often um, an ultrasound or an MR, MRI for placental lie is useful. And why, why is that important with regard to C-section? Um, it, it, in regards to C-section, if there's a C-section scar, the placenta can often implant in that, and you can get cond uh, conditions like placenta previa, where you do get abnormal amounts of bleeding, where the lie is very close okay. to the odds. And would you do that at the, towards, the, um, the, towards the end of term, that scan? Um, uh, it's kind of done probably in the third stage, the third trimester. Okay. Okay. Um, additionally, also, while they're in labour, obviously active management of labour, people have talked about now, active management of third stage of labour, and that's done with um, syntocinon, which is um, a derivative of oxytocin, and that causes contraction of the uterus. And it's just done 
just after the anterior shoulder delivers um, and the mother receives a syntocinol and it has been shown in trials basically to uh, cause an increase in tone. Okay. Um, additionally, you can consider syntometrin, which is ergometrin and syntocinol. Now, ergometrin is an ergot alkaloid, and that also causes um, the uterus to contract. One thing you have to note down is that in patients with preeclampsia, you do not use ergometrin because it causes hypertension. That's important. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can also use uh, drugs like misoprostol. Um, I mean, they've they've not been established in the kind of prevention of PPH, but they have been established in the treatment, which I'll talk about later. Additionally, also early cord clamping, uh, obviously to prevent blood loss and cutting, and just check the observations if these women are at risk um, and examine them for any vaginal blood flow. Because if you check the observations, often you can see that the woman, you know, starting to become tachycardic, her blood pressure is going down, and they're showing all the signs of shock. Okay, well, we'll go into shock a bit later, won't we? So what about risk factors? What are the key risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage? Okay, so before the lady's even, you know, antipartums, and before she's even gone into labour, things like preeclampsia are obviously a risk factor. Preeclampsia is associated with something called HELP syndrome, which actually causes low platelets. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the factors in this HELP syndrome. And obviously, if you have low platelets, you're at increased risk of ble bleeding. Um, patients who are null, null parous, so haven't had a baby before and their uterus maybe isn't so used to contracting, may have been in prolonged labour. Patients who with multiple gestation, as I told you before, yep. so twins, um, you know, triplets, they're always at increased risk of postpartum haemorrhage just because the uterus has been uh, stretched so much. Previous C-section um, and that can also cause things like placenta accreta, paquita, uh, where you get abnormal implantation of the um, placenta, mm -hmm. and placenta previa, where the placenta has um, actually embedded very close to the os, and that can also cause massive hemorrhage. Okay. Now, the intrapartum ones, I mean, we've spoken about these a little already, haven't we? Yeah, so basically prolonged third stage, as I said, in, in that, that was in nulliparous women. Um, Episiotomy really does go with, I think, assisted delivery mm -hmm. in the way that you probably do need to do an episiotomy if you're going to do a forceps or a vacuum. You don't always, but you mostly do. Um, and then things like arrest of descent, lacerations, um, I and mean, that can occur in just any labour, really. Those are, um, the those are kind of tra trauma yeah. causes. Um, and augmented labour often as well. Okay. And then there's some other ones as well. Yeah, so if they've had a previous PPH, you're obviously going to be more vigilant to the fact that they may have one on this um, delivery. Also, age and ethnicity, I'm not sure why, but that has been shown to, uh, that Asian women more risk of PPH, um, obese women, and obviously people with anemia. Okay. So let's move on to the management. Let's start just by talking a little bit about the general management. Okay. So, if there's mild PPH, so you think there's a bit of blood loss, um, obviously you're not, as Ed said, you're not going to get get your little you know meter out and measure it all, but in the absence of signs of shock, all you do is monitor closely, okay? 500 milliliters is not going to actually, um, you know, it's not really going to do that much. These women have, um, they've got an increase in their um, blood volume anyway, because that's one of the things that prepares you for pregnancy. So all you do is just assess the vital signs, start some fluids, um, and just monitor closely. If it's greater than a thousand, and there are signs of shock, then you need to start active management. Okay, so tell us a little bit about active management. Okay, so first of all, um, remember resuscitation is the most important factor in this, okay? So if you're on labor ward and you're by yourself, first of all, you call for help. Yeah, as with all medical emergencies, you probably say. Yes. Always call for help. Okay. Now, when I went on the obstetric emergency course, they gave us certain people who had to call for help. Now, this sounds strange, but actually, if you do it in this order, you will get everyone that you need. So first of all, you need a senior midwife, mm -hmm. okay? You need a senior obstetrician on call. You need the anaesthetist, because if you're thinking about airways and things like that, then you definitely need them there. 
hematologist. Okay, that's for any thrombin, you know, clotting abnormalities. Um, you need to call the blood transfusion lab. Yeah, because they're going to need okay? transfusion. Because obviously the, the cross match is going to be on their way to them, and you need that as fast as possible. You need a porter to take the blood to them. Yeah. You also need someone just scribing all the events that are happening. Okay, because these this is the kind of thing that on the labor ward this happens in a rush and no one notes down what drugs those patients had, how much blood they've lost, what products they've had. So you need someone just just there, just writing it all down, okay? Additionally, you need to be able to communicate what's happening to the patient and the relatives involved because this can be incredibly um, kind of scary. Mm, all these people running into the room. Yeah. Okay, now, if you're on your own, you need to just follow the basic ABC principles, okay? Mm -hmm. So you, you need to check the airway, make sure the airway is patent, okay? Yep. Um, then you need to check breathing, okay? Now, just giving oxygen via non-rebreathable mask can just help initially with the breathing, okay? Even if you can't do anything at that point. Now, in terms of circulation, you need to get IV access in as quickly as possible. Okay? Most, most women will have IV access though, won't they? They may not if they're just if they're just delivering vaginally and there's no risk factors. They may not. They may not have it none at all. Oh, okay. They may not. They may. They may not. Um, you know, this is we're talking about things on labour ward. What if the woman was actually at home delivering? Yeah. She definitely wouldn't have IV no. access then. Um, so you need two large bronchiolae running through with um, colloid fluids uh, just as fast fast as possible. If they're warm, that would be better. But obviously, they're not always warmed. Additionally, when you when you get the IV access, you need to take blood, and you need to get blood for a full blood count, cross match four units, clotting, urine, electrolytes. Okay, and then your management really depends on what the underlying cause is. Okay, so let's go through. And uh, this is just about monitoring, isn't it? Yeah. So lie the patient flat. Okay, catheterize so you can see how much um, the urine output is mm -hmm. in terms of the shock. Get an ECG. Monitor the temperature. And if it's very severe postpartum hemorrhage, it will be necessary to give blood. Yeah, and if you if you haven't got the cross match back, you can just give her an egg, can't you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, these are just some blood values in terms of the thrombin. This is um, for the really keen people. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to actually know this, but um, it's just useful in terms of seeing these are the normal limits. Yeah, and you need to keep these things under control. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about general management. Let's go and talk now about specific management. So for all of those different T's, how do you manage each one in particular? Let's start with tone. Okay, so lack of uterine tone. What you do first is just start by rubbing up a contraction, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, midwives know how to do this very well, um, but obviously we should all learn. Um, and if this doesn't halt the bleeding, then start a bimanual compression, okay? This is where one hand is placed over the pelvis and the other hand is pushed up against the vagina and the body of the uterus is compressed within, okay? Um, and if that doesn't halt the bleeding and increase the tone, then you will then need to start thinking about giving medical management. Such as these drugs. Yes. Okay, so I talked about um, ergometrin before. It's an ergot alkaloid drug and it causes smooth muscle contraction. Um, it actually causes both parts of the uterus to contract, okay? That's the upper and the lower part. So it um, works in a less effective way than syntocinon, um, but it's still useful nevertheless. Why is that less effective, having both parts? It's, it's actually better. Syntocinon only causes the upper segment to contract. And is that, that, is that is better? More, yes, mm. it's more useful. Okay. Okay. Um, its side effects, as I said before, can cause peripheral vasoconstriction and hypertension. So don't give it in preeclampsia. Yeah, don't give it in preeclampsia. Um, then syntocinon, that's everyone's heard of that. Um, it's a derivative of oxytocin. Again, it causes um, uterine contraction, but only in the upper segment, and can be given as an IV infusion. Mm -hmm. Disadvantage of this, really, is that the receptor sites can become saturated, um, and also at very high levels. Remember, uh, oxytocin comes from the posterior, it's secreted from the posterior pituitary, mm -hmm. um, the same place where vasopressin is secreted. They're very similar in structure, so it actually can have antidiuretic effects. Okay, so if, yeah, you don't really want that if they're 
it's a bleeding. Well, you do want that. Well, you do want that. Yeah. But it's said to be one of the disadvantages. I okay. don't know why. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then the, the next two were carboprost and misoprostol. Now, they're both prostaglandins. As you know, prostaglandins also cause contraction of the uterus. Carboprost can be given intramuscularly and it can be given up to eight times. Um, it's prostaglandins, the only problem with them really is that they're contraindicated in women with asthma. Okay. Okay, because they cause bronchoconstriction. Okay, so lots of drug options. Yes. Yeah. What about if the drugs don't work? If the drugs don't work, um, then... They just make you worse. There. Go on. Yes. yes. Um, okay, well, then you need to start thinking about calling theatre because um, th this woman's probably going to have to go and have her uterus packed. Um, the senior obstetrician will be the person in charge of this, okay? And they do lots of procedures, things like balloon tamp tamponade, ligation of the uterine arteries. Now, remember that the uterine arteries are what supply the uterus very simple but yeah. true yeah um, <laughs> and obviously they are it, you know they're the key to stopping the bleeding um and ligation of the internal iliac arteries this is because the uterine arteries come off the internal iliac arteries mm -hmm. not off the aorta so again you know it's just another way to stop bleeding and arterial embolization now you don't actually need to know details of these but these are ju this is just a way to finish it off really now hysterectomy i put that down this is really kind of a last end choice, mm -hmm. um, and there'll be there'll be a senior obstetrician involved in this decision, and probably another senior obstetrician as well, actually, because obviously this woman's, you know, young and serious implications. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's move on now to trauma. Okay, so this this can include things like uterine interversion, um, sorry, inversion, where it actually looks like there's a mass produce, protruding from the vagina, and that's mm. the uterus. Um, and uterine rupture, this is very rare, but dangerous. And again, it presents with shock disproportionate to bleeding, and often on the CTG, which is basically obstetrics version of an ECG for the baby, yep. um, you can see prolonged fetal bradycardia. Okay. Okay, and that often happens in patients who either have had... Um, lots of previous c-sections before and then have had augmentation of labor and it's just too much for the uterus and it ruptures um and also things like kind of cervical laceration and vaginal tears um and obviously the, probably the most common thing for this is to take this patient to theater and try repair and, the tears yeah. yeah okay so moving on now to tissue Okay, so retained placenta is the failure to deliver the placenta within 30 minutes of delivery of the baby. Yeah, and this is the most common tissue cause, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the risk factors for retained placenta are things like placenta previa, so um, as I said, placenta implants near the os, um, high parity, um, previous C-section delivery, so abnormal implantation of the placenta. And if, if you initially, if you can't just, you know, remove placenta by gentle cord contraction um, then you need to think of other maneuvers now you don't actually need to know what these are but i'm just going to just briefly just say okay. so they try this thing called brant maneuver where this is if um the placenta is trapped down lower in the uterus and it's just a case of traction on the umbilical cord and firm suprapubic pressure on the placenta very simple but they have a name for it um, additionally, you can also um, inject oxy, you know, syntocinone into the umbilical vein. Um, and then if these measures don't work, then you have to take this patient to the theatre and manually remove the placenta, being very careful to check that all the membranes have been removed because this can be one of the causes of secondary postpartum hemorrhage ah. where you get retained tissue products and infection. Which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, so thrombin, the last T. Okay, coagulation disorders are actually very rare, um, especially um, in these young, healthy women. Mm -hmm. But you can get, um, you know, abnormalities. First of all, platelets. Now, um, you can get idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Um, you can get thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. All um, hematology things that no one really understands, but they cause abnormalities of platelets, okay? The next one is things with clotting. Now, um, probably in women, most common one's going to be uh, von 
Willebrand's disease. Yeah, because haemophilia is X-linked. Yes, yes. We've, we've discussed that earlier. Yeah, we have. But it is possible, we should say, yes. it is possible to get an X-linked um, disease presenting in a woman. But it's quite yes. rare, very rare. Additionally, also derangements of the INR in patients with um, liver disease. Um, and you need to think about giving these patients vitamin K. Um, and then others are things like preeclampsia and amniotic fluid embolism. And often what they can cause is um, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Yeah, or, which can cause... or the preeclampsia HELP syndrome. Yes, yeah. so no platelets. Okay. Um, that can often you know, present with bleeding everywhere and abnormalities in the INR, the APTT and the fibrinogen levels and the fibrin de degradation products. And then you replace as necessary. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we've looked at all the T's for... Uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage. Very briefly, could you just tell us a little bit about the management of second, secondary postpartum hemorrhage? Okay, this is usually due to endometriitis. Seems odd, but infection can cause bleeding. Mm. Okay, and um, often it's due to retained products of um, you know of the placenta. Uh, say if you've had a manual um, kind of placental removal and they haven't taken it all out. Now, what you do is basically investigations are just bloods so looking at white cell count looking at crp levels and then you can do some swabs um, and an ultrasound to look for any retained products um, and then treatment is just simple antibiotics usually so broad spectrum is, amox, yeah, and, metro yeah. and this is the most common cause of secondary postpartum hemorrhage okay so that's the basics of management. Can you just give us a quick summary because it's all sort of a lot going on, isn't there? There is a lot going on, okay? Remember, postpartum hemorrhage is due to the four T's, okay? Tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombin, okay? And the active management in the third stage of the PPH um, reduces, sorry, in the third stage of labor, reduces PPH by 60%. That's okay. massive. So active management is important. If you suspect PPH, then you should give, um, you should just, at first, if it's mild, monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take some bloods and fluids. If it's more severe, please call for help yep. from all the people that I told you. And um, just to start an ABC management and think about medical and surgical therapies. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so that's it for this podcast. Thank you, Kenga. Thank you. Um, we'll see you again very soon.